Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to another episode. As you guys are aware, alhamdulillah, we have been working and interviewing people on the issues of business, how to make your business grow, how to be a very good entrepreneur, and how to manage money the best of ways. And we are bringing professionals. And as you know, we have the summit coming up on the 16th of September. So we are getting ready before the summit by having amazing conversations with our guests. But before you get to know my guests for today, stay tuned and we will be right back. All right, welcome back. My guest for today is none other than Othman Rashid. Habibi, good to have you on the program. Excited to be here. Um, thank you for the invite. I am more excited to have you, you know. I'm going to get free classes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the reasons I haven't come to your place, I'm like thinking, oh, I need to pay this man to come learn this. I know it's very important, but I have to make very good budget. So today, my uh, my my viewers are going to get a bit of the snippet. <laughs> yeah. Well, How are you, brother? Fine, alhamdulillah. It's an absolute thank honor to have you here. I'm so excited. Thank, thank you, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. Let's go straight to our conversation for today. I know that you are, uh, you know, part of the Forbes Coach Council. And I was quite intrigued when I saw that post. You know, I was like, well, he's a black guy and he's a coach in the, in the council. How did you become that? How do you ascend that, mashallah? Alhamdulillah. So first of all, I mean, yes, I'm a member of the Forbes Coaches Council, but interestingly, I'm the first Northern person to join the Forbes Coaches Council. So it's a huge honor. I feel like it was a, it's a path for me to take so that other people come in after me can also emulate that path. Basically, for you to join the Forbes Coaches Council, you have to be coaching for at least three years minimum. So they will check your track record. They'll ask you to submit a lot of details. You do interviews as well. And it's actually an invite-only kind of um, association. So when you join, they'll check all those things. Once they check all those things and they vet that you've been coaching for at least three years and you have results to show for it, and then you take you know jump through some hoops and then you eventually join the Forbes Coaches Council. So yeah, amazing. Really and awesome. how has that been for you personally? It's it has skyrocketed my business. Like, mm. so, I mean, the fact that, you see, people don't buy from people unless they know, like, and trust you. So that trust factor is the major thing. As soon as I joined the Forbes Coaches Council, it gave me the opportunity to start publishing my thoughts on Forbes.com. Mm. So publishing my thoughts, people, if you Google my name now, mo most of the things you'll see will be my articles that I've written in Forbes Coaches mm -hmm. Council. Mm -hmm. So think about it. You're thinking about hiring a business coach and you search the business coach's name and you see that the person is writing on Forbes.com, definitely it, it boosts your trust factor. So it has really, really um, helped me to really grow my business in mm -hmm. coaching factories. And it also made me meet other amazing coaches from around the world amazing. that I get to also learn from and then I come back and I point to my community. That's really amazing because I know, you know, that's what you just said, you know, you get to meet other coaches and it's so beautiful meeting different people from different countries, learning from them. Tell me, what is that different uh, perspective you get from them that you've learned so far that I want people to know? One of the major things that I've learned is the fact that persistence is the most important thing you need to have as a business owner. So most times we think that the problems we have in Nigeria is only in Nigeria. Things like inflation, things like, you know, things are not working well. But by interacting with other coaches from other countries, I see that, funny enough, the same problems that we have in Nigeria is the same problems they're having everywhere else. But I've also learned that the, the people that are able to overcome those challenges are people that have persisted. Think about it. I'm sure your first episode that you've done wasn't as good as, I mean, the 100. It was terrible. Exactly. <laughs> so that's the thing. So persistence is the name of the game. So from learning that from other coaches, I've been able to come back and tell my clients, look, listen, just keep quiet and do the work. <laughs> Don't complain about the results you are not getting mm. for the work that you are not willing to do. Mm, that's quite deep. You know, can you elaborate more on what you just said lastly, you know, about don't expect the result for the work you're not doing. Mm. Does that mean that for you to get to places you've never been before, you have to become someone you've never been before, you have to go out of your way? Some people have the opinion that, you know, I'm just running a business, I just want to do my thingy, I just want to just stick to this and likes of it. Uh, to what extent do you think that one needs to become an expert in their business before they move out there? So it's you don't have to become a, an expert before you move out there. Mm -hmm. However, you must have that plan that you want to be the best at everything that you're doing. I mean, of what point is it you go into a business and you just go into it me to be mediocre? Mm. The essence of being into business is you're continually improving yourself. Mm. One of the concepts that I find very key and very important is a Japanese concept called Kaizen, and it means continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. It means that you will never be the best version of yourself 
But as long as you keep trying to grow, look at all the big companies. Apple, for example, I'm a huge Apple fan, right? Apple always iterates. They always bring out something better. And even if they bring out a new phone, you will see that after a few weeks, there's an update. Mm. Most people, the mistake they make is they want to wait until the product is perfect. That's why there's something called the minimum viable product. What is the smallest iteration that you can bring out into the market so that you can learn and get feedback and then you can now use that feedback to make the product better. So as a business owner, your work is to continually improve yourself, continually improve your systems, continually improve your, your, the way that you satisfy your customers. Amazing, you know, not to go too deep because I know you people pay you for this your time, right? <laughs> but tell me, if I, uh, you know, I want to start up a business, I have ideas, or rather I have some few money in my hands, and I just want to be an entrepreneur, but my interest for entrepreneurship is not that deep. What do you advise me to do? So I advise you, one of the major things you need to do is to find something you're passionate about. Mm. Because you see, when people say, follow your passion, it's not because um, they just want to say it. The reason why you need to follow your passion is that, first of all, entrepreneurship is hard. <laughs> so imagine all the basketballs that you face in life, right. and then you're not doing something that you don't enjoy doing. <laughs> it will just be worse for you. Swear so I find mean. a passion. Think about how you can make money off of that passion that you have. Mm. And if, you, if, you, if you're working at a job that you enjoy doing, it means that you're not working for the rest of your life. Mm. For example, people pay me to come and speak. Trust me, there are places I will go to and I can speak for free, but I'll still charge them. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's an exciting thing whereby the thing that you enjoy doing, you get paid for it. So find a passion, find something you're passionate about and see how you can monetize or create value from that passion. And then you So I always have this question, right? You know, when, I, when we want to go into business, people tell you that, oh, you need to get this investor, get that investor. I personally, I, so I have this fear of taking someone's money, money and you know, I have this like, so it was at the sea, if you don't do this, your business is not going to run like seven. Um, so tell me, how do you draw a balance in this aspect? Now you've spoken about, okay, find my passion. Now I have my passion, right? How do I go about it? Yeah, how do I scale it up? So one of the things that you need to understand is money is actually not what you need when you're trying to start a business. Wow. Yeah. A lot of people make that mistake. Oh, I'm waiting to get money. What you need first and foremost is to identify who are the people you want to serve. Who is the client you want to serve? Once you can identify the clients that you want to serve, the next thing you want to identify is what is the value proposition that you are giving them? So for example, this your entire show, you have a certain audience that you want to serve. You have, what is the value that you're giving them? You want to enlighten them, you want to entertain them, you want to educate them. Mm -hmm. Then the last thing is what is the channel that you can use to reach out to them? And the beautiful thing is now, internet has, has made the world so close together. Before, for you to be able to do what you're doing now, you have to go to a studio, 100%. right? But I mean, look at us here. You have your own show. People can get to see you. So start with where you are. Start with what you have. Mm. Identify the customers that you want to serve. Identify what is that value that you're giving them. And then what is the channel that you can use to reach out to them? When you do that, then you can now say you have a proof of concept. Only seek for money to increase your reach but not to start. That's what I always advise business people. That's really amazing. I think another thing that a lot of young business people have issues with is decision making, mm. right? Decision making is a big problem for those who are entrepreneurs. How do you think they one can properly channel their thought when they want to make a key decision? So one of the things I always say is this, never make a business decision out of fear. Always make a decision out of faith. So most times what people, what happens is people say, Oh, I don't want to make this decision. What if so, so, so happens? Hmm. Nobody said that life is going to be easy, right? Never pray for easy times, pray for strength. So what I always advise people is that when you're taking a decision, just analyze and assess, but never take a decision out of fear. Just take it out of faith, knowing that, look, it's going to get better. I'll give you an example. October 20th, 2020 was my last day in my job. I worked 13 years in oil and gas. And I resigned from a high paying job to come and do this coaching. A lot of people thought I had gone crazy. <laughs> but the reason why I did it was because I took that decision, not out of fear of what if I, I'm not able to make it, but out of faith that I know that if I put in the work, inshallah, I'll get the results that I want. Mm. And it's been fantastic. And that's quite deep. It's quite amazing that you spoke about how we need to have faith 
and you know not thinking of what will happen or wouldn't happen and as muslim i think it's very important for us to understand that you know you have to put the effort for it Definitely. to you know meet what allah has predestined for you mm -hmm. and either ways you don't put the effort then you that's you have your safety so you exactly. put the effort and inshallah you enjoy from the success and i think it's quite important that you know i, I love the way you put that statement thank you so much thank you. furthermore let's go back to people who run businesses but they're emotional huh. <laughs> all right um i personally am a very emotional person so I've been, it's been quite difficult to, you know, run some certain businesses and likes of it. And even though sometimes you want to be like that strong person and assume some certain position, but your mental disposure is just your mental disposure. And it's quite difficult to find a balance. What do you think one should do in this situation? Do we need a manager? What do we need to do? What exactly do you think one should do if they're in this situation? So the honest truth is this, you can't divorce yourself from emotions. We're mm. human beings, right? emotions come up you know what that's so deep because you know what people say they say that you have to keep emotions aside and business aside yeah, you nah, can't. i love that yeah you can't how how do you want to keep emotions aside people don't buy from facts people don't buy based on logic mm -hmm. people buy based on emotions think about it have you ever gone to a place and after you bought something when you come back home you're like hey, i should have bought that thing but if you ask yourself why did you buy it it's probably because the person in the shop made you feel good about yourself and you oh, bought it yeah. so emotions are important However, negative emotions is what we need to be able to overcome. And the easiest way to overcome it is by giving a pause. You see, the distance between stimulus and reaction, that is where your power is. So once something stimulates you and you feel like reacting, give yourself a pause. Sometimes it just takes three deep breaths, right? Once you're able to do that, you see that um, those negative emotions will just pass so a client calls you is insulting you and you want to like you know revenge or mm -hmm. tell the person my friend are you are you the one paying me take take a time off pause give yourself that space and then you'll be able to control yourself you can't divorce emotions from business but what you need to do is to be able to remove negative emotion mm -hmm. and creating that space is what will help you to be able to make that's really amazing off man thank you so much you. Shall, i was just going to take a short break and we'll be right back so our viewers you know this, this has been an interesting session with Othman. i'm learning so much and guess what we're learning for free mashallah but inshallah stay tuned and we'll be right back immediately after this short break Assalamu alaikum, welcome, but we have been discussing, alhamdulillah, with my brother, Othman Rashid, and we'll be talking about amazing stuff that you are not paying, remember? <laughs> so this episode, you must share with the people out at home, mashallah. Othman, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. I'll welcome. go straight to networking. I am very certain that um, networking plays a major role, you know, in business and the likes of it, but what uh, method, or rather, what steps do you think one can take to maintain those kind of connect, you know, networking and those kind of connections somebody has already built for a long time. So, like they say, right, your net worth is your network, right? One of the easiest things you need to understand in networking and high value networking, not just networking, but the fun of it, mm. is that where you meet someone is more important than how you meet someone. Mm. So, one of the critical success factors for networking is putting yourself in places where you meet high net worth individuals in a common field. I'll give you an example. The other day I went to, so I used to play polo before. Well, I still play now, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to polo club and, you know, during the Lagos tournament, and there's this thing called divot stomping. So divot stomping is the, during break, you go and all the divots that the horses removed, mm -hmm. you, you place it back with your feet. It's a networking opportunity. And at that time, the people that I was standing with while we we're mm. doing divot stomping was one, Ali, Alaji Ali Kodongote, mm. and then um, GT Bank CEO, and a few other top notch individuals. Now, we were discussing, we we're just talking, how are you? How's everything? How if I need the game and all that? Imagine meeting there, it was a, there was no, 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 no walls, mm. right? It was a good meeting. But if I had met GT Bank CEO in GT Bank, he's not going to listen to me. Do you mm -hmm. get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, because we met at a particular place. Mm -hmm. So what I always advise people is that try to come for events 
that you meet high net worth individuals, right? Mm -hmm. Put yourself in those kind of places. Go for seminars, go for workshops, go for conferences. These things cost an arm and a leg, but at the end of the day, the network that you meet, why do you think people go for all these Harvard MBAs and all those things? It's not for the education, it's for the network. Mm -hmm. If you meet somebody and you stay at Harvard alumni, automatically that breaks every barrier that you can imagine, right? And the critical rule for networking is that always follow up within 24 hours of when you meet the person. Mm. So if I meet you today and I exchange numbers with you, if I don't follow up within 24 hours, by the time I'm calling you again, you probably won't remember. Uh, but if, if I follow up within 24 hours, oh, I met you yesterday, oh yeah, follow up within 24 hours and then you'll be able to you know, maintain that network and relationship. Amazing. Coming back to, you know, mentorship, you know, uh, for me personally, I've been, I've been saying this for a long time, right? A lot of us as young people, we need people to help us go to places that we can go by ourselves. Yeah. Meaning you need a mentor who has been there, Zonda, because I have to believe that, you know, if you're in the box, you know, you can't see the level, right? And if yeah. you're in the frame, you can't see the picture, right? So how do you think one can get a mentor? And what are the qualities can we look out for before getting a mentor? Because sometimes you have people that... They don't really understand what you're doing, but they feel that see, you're my younger brother. I want to be your mentor, so they advise you and they advise you wrongly. Wrong. Mm -hmm. So, what are the what are the qualities for me as a young person to see and say, okay, this is the kind of mentor I need to have? After you know, going back to the first thing you said, identifying my passion, what do I do? So, the first thing you need to do is to look at somebody's talk to do ratio. People talk a lot these days. Everybody can come and talk, but look at someone's talk to do ratio, meaning that. What is the ratio of the things that he actually does? The things he says, does he actually do them? If you see someone like that, then you know that, okay, that person is a go-getter. At least the person is in the arena, right? Now, and one of the issues that people have with mentorship is that they think that mentorship must be one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have to. For example, if I want someone up there to mentor me, I don't have to go and meet the person. Most of those people have written books. Most of those people have podcasts. Most of those people have YouTube channels. Can I go and binge watch their YouTube channels first? I'll give you an example. One of the one of the one of the mentors I have in the in the African speaking sphere is Vusi Tembakwayo, right? Amazing speaker and everything. For a long time before I actually met him, I met him sometime last day in Lagos. But before I met him, right, one of the things I was doing was I was watching his YouTube videos. Mm. He he wrote certain books. I, I read those books, right? So when you read a book written by someone you get into the person's head and and experience life the way the person is experiencing mm. and every pitfall that that person has has had along the way you can avoid it right so that's one of the things about mentorship but also the major critical factor that you need to look out for is the person's talk to do ratio if the person is an action taker then i mean the person would have taken a lot of actions and done a lot of mistakes that when they eventually advise you, you know that at least it's coming from a place of experience mm. as opposed to keyboard warriors that we have. <laughs> <laughs> That's really amazing. And I like the fact that you emphasize on the fact that, you know, a mentor doesn't mean that it has to be one-on-one. -on -one. You can mm. learn from someone. Like I learned from so many videos when I was starting my TV show from the likes of them, Opera, David Latherman, Steve Harvey. I learned from their videos and how they do their stuff. And, you know, I've never met them, but, you know, from the videos, I learned so much, much right? Them, yeah. So tell me, let's come back to faith now, right? A lot of people have this toxic notion, or rather they have, the, a lot of people have this toxic notion that if you're a faith person, meaning if you're spiritual, you should engage in business, you know, stay away from business, right? And, I, and I've seen that a lot. And that's where they say, oh, this, you, you, where are you making money from? You know, you're just a, a guy who does that one and the likes of it, right? And I've seen a lot of people personally meeting me, and they're like, Ah, wait, how are you making money and light? What do you do? And likes of it. For me, I enjoy doing business and likes of it. But how do you think this has affected the socioeconomic stand of we as an Ummah? I think that that's the major issue that we have. Mm. We misunderstand the entire teachings. So, I mean, if you look at it, if you go back and study the Sahabas, right? This is where people had money. There were people that had money that could fund war campaigns that could fund the hour, could fund a lot of things. If they didn't have money, how would they be able to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I believe that it, we've taken a mentally lazy way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And instead of, so for example, if you say, oh, it's Kader, it's been written down already, to she can, I call it, I'll just go and rest. <laughs> no, you work, you work towards it, right? If it's written for you, then try to be the best, mm -hmm. right? 
we look at things like saying that, oh, we're always striving for Iksan excellence, but we think that Iksan and excellence only has to do with our acts of worship. Yes, it has to do with that. Mm. But in every other sphere of your life, if you're going to go into business, then be the best business owner that you can be. Mm. And I think that the major issue we have is there has been a disconnect from the people that have actually made it, right? We don't see them engaging fully in faith-based activities. 100%. Right? So if we could see them engaging in faith-based activities, coming down to everybody's level, we'll see that, okay, this person becoming rich did not make him all of a sudden pompous or all of a sudden thinking that he can't relate with, with the ummah, right? And then we can now start to emulate. But I think that that's like the biggest issue. That so one have. is to find a balance, basically. Balance, yes. Balance, Very is, important. balance is important, right? Mm. Leave this world like a like, like a traveler, right? right. Don't cling on to, to Abunduni, as mm. they say. But do your best mm. and put out great products, great services, and inshallah, the money will come. Often this is really, really beautiful. But before we end the program, right, I know a lot of people look up to you and, you know, a lot of people have learned so much from you. I've met people personally who have told me how they have benefited from what you're doing. In a very, 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 very short sentence, right, what do you really want them to know? So I think the major thing that I want people to know is don't be afraid of doing the work. Just do the work. Don't be afraid. Fear is the biggest issue that we have. We're always, that's the reason why we don't put out ourselves out there. That's the reason why we don't, you know, do amazing things. We're afraid. If you can overcome fear. And why, why, how do you overcome fear? Let's go back to the Quran, right? Allah mm-hmm. Subhanahu says, Innam al Usri Yusra. Right? Verily, in difficulty, there is ease. So don't look for ease. Chase the difficulty. But the know that Allah happen. has promised you that inside that difficulty, there will be ease. And inshallah, once you do that, Life becomes so easy for you. Amazing, man. And make sure you come for the summit. I uh, look forward to seeing you there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Habibi. Uh, I mean, I'm so excited to have you here, man. I'm so excited. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. All right, viewers, we'll come to the end of this episode. You've done what you really need to know. And Alhamdulillah, you know, as I said earlier, people go to pay and learn all this stuff. We've been able to have Othman come on the show, tell us a bit of stuff we need to know, stuff we need to learn. What you need to do now is try to see how you can implement all these things in your life. And guess what? You can learn so much more from the summit coming up on the 16th, inshallah, of September. Don't miss out. Make sure you tell your friends, share with your loved ones, so we will be able to learn. And the team for this year's summit is the, the future in perspective, business, and morality. Until the next episode, I leave you all in the care of the most gracious, most merciful. Assalamu alaikum.